Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. James Salzman. He is the Donald Brand Distinguished Professor of Environmental Law with joint appointments at the UCLA School of Law and at the Brand School of Environmental Science and Management at UC Santa Barbara. And today we're going to talk about his book, Mine, How the Hidden Rules of Ownership Control Our Lives. So, Dr. Salzman, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Yes, thanks for having me. Obrigado. <laughs> Great. So, uh, I mean, where does the sense of ownership in humans come from? Well, I mean, do you mean in terms of human bodies or human parts or the whole, the whole, the whole topic? Uh, I mean, ju just in general, I mean, yeah. psychologically speaking, where does the sense of ownership that we have come from? And perhaps probably other species do not have it. I don't know. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think that uh, if you talk about the sort of innate sense of what's mine, I think we all start with fundamentally what's mine is ourselves. Right, this notion of self, of self ownership. What we do in the book is we basically say there's six basic stories that we all use and always have used and always will use to justify ownership claims. And one of those, as you pointed out, is self ownership. Uh, it's mine because it's is part of me. If you go back to John Locke, who's one of the great theorists of labor, he popularized what's known as the labor theory. It's mine because I worked for it. The basis for his argument is that things we labor over is ours because we own ourselves and therefore by extension we must own our labor. Now when you talk about self-ownership obviously the great um, uh, the great example and fear is slavery which is the ultimate uh, sort of abrogation or loss of self-ownership. Uh, today the issues of self-ownership range everything from uh, do you own <coughs> your genetic <coughs> your genetic data if you send in a, a, a cheek swap to 23andMe, um, do you want your click stream uh, when you, you know, when you visit a website? Is that part of the self ownership claim uh, as well? Uh, can women um, be be paid for acting as surrogate mothers, basically bearing someone else's someone else's child? So all of these, you know, are, are questions of self ownership. Mm -hmm. But I mean, could you tell us more about those, I'm not sure if it's six or seven rules that you expose in the book that people take into account when deciding who owns what? I think so. I mean, so let's just take, let's take two simple examples. One very simple, one stupid, but, but simple. So for the ones very simple, let's just say you're in a playground, right? Anyone who spends any time in a playground will hear one word, and that word is mine. Right? And that's why, we, that's why we, we, we titled the book with that term. But just take an example, you see two uh, toddlers who are fighting over a shovel in the, play, in, the, in, the, in the sandbox. All we hear them shouting is mine, 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 mine. And we think, you know, don't be stupid, just you know, share, share the shovel. What they actually are saying is more sophisticated. One is likely saying it's mine because I had it first. I put it down to do something else, but I had it first. The other is saying it's mine because I'm holding on to it. And what's actually going on there are two competing stories. One story is first come, first serve, right? First possession. It's one of the six basic stories. The other is current possession. It's mine because I'm holding on to it. Those are both equally valid claims, right? And we can find examples of those all over the place. So how do we mediate those two claims that are equally, equally legitimate? Let's take another example. This is what we use as the anchor story in our book. So you're flying all right, on an airplane. Uh, how tall are you? Uh, well, in terms of feet, uh, Meters, five, five feet eight, I think. Okay, I'm, not, so I'm, not, I'm not sure about the conversion, but I think. But average, your average height. Okay, so I'm I'm six one. I'm I'm, I'm a little above average height. So let's say you're sitting in front of me on a, on a flight, uh, and you recline your seat, and I'm you know I'm using my laptop, and all of a sudden my laptop is in my chest. I say, hey, you know, don't recline your seat. Uh, and you say, I can recline my seat because I have this button. And the button allows me to bend the seat, the seat back into this space. And you're saying it's, a, it, it's mine because of attachment. It's mine because it's attached to something that I already own. I say, no, it's mine because of current possession. I'm using a space. You backing into it is trespass. If you look at headlines, there actually are fights over this all the time that are reported in the news. 
And, you know, Michael uh, Heller, my co-author and I have given, you know, talked about this book dozens of times. And whenever we do it on Zoom, we use the poll feature. And it's almost always 50-50 in terms of who thinks the, the, the party's on the right, either the seat recliner or the knee defender. And the reason there's such a split is people basically are choosing one story over the other. And so a lot of what's involved with ownership engineering, that we call it, is how the owners of the resource basically set these things up because uh, they know the stories. And so you might say, well, look, if the airplane, if the airline just announced, here's the rule, you can recline. Here's the rule, you can only recline if you ask. Here's the rule, no reclining. In all three of those circumstances, there are no fights. But airlines don't do that, right? And they don't do that on purpose. The reason they don't do that on purpose is they're selling the same wedge of space behind the seat twice. Once to you to recline and once to me to work on. And because there's ambiguity in who owns that space, you and I get angry at each other over who owns it, even though we really should be angry together at the airline because they created this conflict in the first place. Right. But I, I mean, are these stories, claims, rules, whatever you want to label them, are them, are they universal? I mean, do we find them across all sorts of these different societies and cultures? Uh, it's a good question. The answer, as far as we can tell, is yes. Um, I mean, we've, again, given this talk a lot, the book's been on the market for, you know, for uh, six months now, it's done well. No one has suggested that there's a, a new story that we haven't added. But there's, there, there's some uh, subtleties I think it's important to point out. One subtlety is um, you say, well, look, it's, it's mine because I bought it. It's mine because someone gave it to me. Isn't that a different, a different story? And the answer is no, because how do you know that person owned it? Well, they say, well, someone else sold it to me, right? It's, it's all the way down. Ultimately, once you go through all the transactions or the gifts, there's someone who had an original claim of ownership. And that's going to be based on one of those six, those six stories. The other thing it's important to recognize is that different cultures will emphasize different stories. So indigenous cultures, they're much more likely to focus the sixth story, which is it's mine because I'm part of the family. It's mine because I'm part of the group. It's sort of group or communal ownership. That's much more important in some societies than others. But as far as we can tell, uh, and we've talked to anthropologists about this, that is the playbook. There are six stories, uh, and that's always been the case, and I think always will be. So when it comes to situations where people argue who owns what, I mean, how do people decide which of these stories prevails? I mean, right. beca because, I mean, it could be through argument or it could be just a cultural thing. I mean, perhaps in a particular culture, people simply decide that, okay, this story always prevails over the others and they right. might have a hierarchy or something like that. I don't know. How does it work exactly? Yeah, so the answer is yes and, right? It's all of those. Um, and uh, there, there's a lot going on there. So let's just take line standing, queuing, right? In Britain... It, because this is an ownership story, right? You own your place in line as long as, you know, it, it's basically, it's, it's a relative idea of ownership. doesn't matter. You don't actually own the piece of pavement, but you own your spot. I'm in line ahead of you, right? So I have a superior right to access the resource before you do. That's a, that's a property right. So if you're in the UK, that's going to be very strongly respected. If someone cuts in the queue, people, you know, tut tut and, and, and basically look down at you and such. If you're in China, uh, it's a different culture and they just they just you know push to the to the there's, there's no sort of strong tradition of queuing so part part of it is cultural um, part of it is um, <clears throat> is power right so <clears throat> oftentimes <clears throat> excuse me there are legal rules over who gets what um, and those rules are, you know may be determined by by money uh, by political power obviously those two are often are often linked um, and so, for example, uh, for uh, if you look at, um, oh, what would be a good example? A good example might be um, the law of the sea, right? So the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, nations own up to 200 miles off their coast. It could be five miles. It could be 1,000 miles. 200 miles is what the nations of the world settled on, and the powerful nations said this is the way it's going to be. The U.S. at the time, this was the 1970s, basically, they're a big coastal power. 
They said, we want to extend this very far out. There were countries that wanted it to be much, much closer. Um, there are norms, values that are inherent in this. So just take something as simple as ladies first, right? When you open a door, ladies should go through first. That's actually a, a property, right? That's an ownership, that's an ownership decision, but it's value laden, right? A lot of feminists would say that's insulting, right? Why should, why should ladies have to go first? How about the closest person to the door goes first, right? Why should people be deferential assuming that they're, you know, they're not as, they're not as strong or whatever, whatever goes into that idea of ladies first. So it, it's, it's a very complicated issue. And, and one of the points we make in the book is that everything that's of value is up for grabs always, right? If there's more people that want something than can get it, then you need ownership rules. And one of the things that's interesting to think about in this regard is sort of the history of, of myth. So you think about the sort of the, the great creation myths of civilizations and they all turn on ownership or many of them turn on ownership. So Greek mythology, right? What is a catalyst for the, the spark of, of human civilization? It's Prometheus. What does Prometheus do? Prometheus steals fire from the gods on Mount Olympus. He takes something that is not his own. That's an ownership story. What's the creation myth uh, in Judeo-Christian culture? It's the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve take something that's not theirs, right? They, they pluck the fruit from the, the forbidden fruit, from the tree of knowledge. And on top of that, what happens when they taste the fruit? They're quite literally uh, expelled. There's trespass all of a sudden. You can't come back to this space. This is no longer yours. So why, I think it's a reasonable question, why is ownership so central to these basic myths of human, of human culture, human civilization. And Michael and I think it's because it's the rules of ownership that basically create the scaffolding for community. If you don't have understood rules for who gets what, then we just kill each other all the time. Mm -hmm. So is there anything that changes in the way we understand ownership when we move from tangible things uh, to intangible ones, like for example, ideas or intellectual property? Yeah, so, uh, you know, whenever you see kids fighting in a playground, it's always over something, some thing. It's never over a joke or an idea. And in fact, we have di our different parts of the brain sort of think differently about these things. And so there's something that psychologists have known about for quite a while now called the endowment effect. Mm -hmm. And essentially what the endowment effect is, is that if you are possessing something physical, uh, it, the value that you attribute to it goes up because it's yours. You know, you're, you're less likely to give it up. The endowment effect for, for ideas, for intangible things is less. This is why, you know, for example, people don't think twice about stealing passwords, right? Or about streaming right. things because, you know, no one, I should say no one, very few people would go into a store and steal a DVD of the Game of Thrones. People, millions of people have no problem using someone else's password to watch Game of Thrones. How can that be, right? It's, it's theft in both cases, but we think of it. We think of it differently. Uh, and that's why also at the beginning of these movies, you know, the, the movie producers are trying as, like crazy to get us to think about these things like physical. So, you know, theft of, you know, uh, uh, theft of movies and such is a crime. Interpol has a big, you know, screen that comes up whenever you see, whenever you see these movies. Uh, but that can work both ways, right? So for example, when you go on Amazon, right? Amazon intentionally tries to make the experience of shopping as physical like as possible. You have a shopping cart, you put things in your shopping cart, you go to the checkout. Now, if you are buying an ebook or an iTunes, um, then, uh, you know, you think people, this and study has been done on this. Most people think about 80% of people think that it's the same as owning the physical book or the physical album. And that's wrong. What you are doing more and more is you are basically licensing access to a stream of ones and zeros. And there is a growing gap between what we think we own, what we feel like we own and what we actually own. And so there are plenty of examples of Amazon and Google and Apple literally taking back uh, digital content they've given us access to probably the most the two of the most sort of disturbing examples there was a copyright dispute over with um uh, a, a book that amazon was selling 
uh, George Orwell's 1984, which is sort of dystopic future with Big Brother, mm -hmm. that was taken from people's bookshelves, right? From their from their um, their Kindle accounts, taken back. Uh, Google launched a new sort of home nest uh, program, and they bricked. That's a term that's entered the uh, the lexicon. B r i c k. They bricked the current operating system of the other of what they'd sold earlier, so people would be forced to buy the new system. Uh, and so, you know, we're shifting to more and more an online world, and our brains, our kind of reptile brains, haven't made that haven't made that switch yet. Yeah, since we're talking about businesses, is it that they take advantage of people's sense of ownership? to make a profit, to sell their products, et cetera? Of course, of course. Uh, and this is the idea of ownership, of ownership engineering. So let me give you an example in this regard of, of, of Disney, right? Disney are the masters of ownership, of ownership engineering. And so if you go to Disney World, um, it's called the happiest place on earth. That's their, that's their mm -hmm. tagline. Uh, it is the number one honeymoon location in the United States where couples go after they've been married. Uh, the one time it's not the happiest place on earth is when you're waiting five hours in line to go on a ride, which used to happen um, because there are more people than the ride can physically take. So Disney realized this was, this was an issue. So what they did is they introduced something called the fast pass. And the fast pass allowed you to basically go to the ride, take a ticket that would say in two hours during this 15 minute window, you can go into a separate line and you'll get into the ride much more quickly. And so what the fast pass did is it took the ownership rule of first come first served and it changed it. If you have a fast pass, even if someone's been waiting, you still get in ahead of them, but it's transparent, right? People see, people see what you're doing. Um, and this basically allowed people to get out of the waiting in line to, to buy merchandise, right? And to, to spend more in Disney, these giant turkey legs that they sell. But Disney realized that was still leaving money on the table. So they introduced another approach called the VIP pass. This is like a super duper fast pass. The VIP pass for about $3,000 to $5,000 per day allows a group, a family basically, um, to skip every line. Uh, but there's a problem. And the problem is if the people waiting in the regular line who are first come first served, or the people who are waiting in the fast pass line Fast pass comes before first come, first serve. If they see these folks just going straight in, they're going to get angry. And so for many of the most popular rides, the VIP pass holders have a special escort who takes them to a special entrance that no one sees that's behind the ride. Uh, and so Disney has found a way to monetize waiting in line, which you wouldn't think would, would make sense. Here's another example. Now, I don't know if this is the case in Portugal or not, but in the United States, uh, outside many cities, uh, there's a problem of rush hour, right? Going in mm -hmm. in the morning, going out in the yes. evening. The fast pass used to be, I'm sorry, the, the fast lane, the lane on the, on the edge, used to be first come, first served. If you get in the fast lane, you stay in there until you get into the slower lane. Now, during rush hour, it's what's called a high occupancy vehicle lane, an HOV lane. So depending on the city, you can only use that lane if you're carpooling, if you have two or three or more passengers. You can only use that lane if you're driving an electric car. And those goals are environmental, right? The owner of the resource, the Department of Transportation, is using the fast lane to try to clean up the air quality. Uh, and that's, you know, that's basically ownership engineering. More and more cities, though, are moving towards something called congestion pricing. And it turns out that there are people who have more money than time. And so in these cities, what happens is there is a toll that you pay and it's electronic. You've got a little transponder on your dashboard. And so, for instance, if you want to go from northern Virginia into Washington, D.C. during morning rush hour, it can cost up to thirty dollars. That's about, I don't know, 20, 22 euros, mm -hmm. uh, 23 euros um, to get into the fast lane. Uh, so in all these cases, the owners are managing allocation, are managing ownership rules to maximize either money uh, or the environment. Or the last example I can give you, which I think everyone's familiar with, is flying. <clears throat> so when I was growing up, if you got to the airport early, after first class, you got in earlier. You got on the plane earlier. It was first come, first served. 
that's not the case anymore, right? Now you have to be platinum, ruby, silver, you know, whatever precious metal. Why do the airlines do that? They want to encourage uh, passengers to fly frequently <clears throat> to purchase more expensive fares. That's ownership engineering as well. Right. So could you explain now the ownership principle of attachment and perhaps give us a few examples of the kinds of things it, uh, it applies to? Sure. So attachment is the ownership story that's probably least, least known. It's why your home is your castle. So attachment says it's mine because it's attached to something that's mine. So if you look actually at a land deed, right, the actual legal record that gives you ownership of land, it's just a piece of paper and it gives you access to basically a um, land surface. It's unclear what's, whether you own what's above or whether you own what's below. And so, for example, do you own the groundwater? Do you own the minerals? Do you own the oil that's underneath your property? The traditional story uh, has been uh, the Roman idea was you own from heaven to hell. So there was basically this cylinder that would go all the way to hell and all the way up to heaven. And there were some early cases uh, that were uh, in the early 1900s that basically people brought trespass suits against airlines, saying, when you fly you know, over, my, over my property at 10,000 or 20,000 feet, you're trespassing, which you know, there's, a, there's a logic to that. Uh, the courts fortunately said, no, you do not own to heaven, right? <clears throat> there's a, there's a, a, limited, a limited airspace. Well, um, then the question becomes, what do we do uh, about drones, right? So there's a future that's not very far off when Amazon, uh, HDL, um, other delivery services are going to want to do delivery by drones. Uh, and the question is how close above your property can they fly? They, they fly 200 feet above, do you own up to 200 feet, 100 feet, 50 feet? Governments have said how high drones can fly. They have not said how low drones can fly. And so this is one of the current questions for the theory of attachment. Uh, how much of the air above your property is attached to your property? Um, do you own? Let me give you another example that we talk about in the book. So there's a town in, in California called Sunnyvale. Uh, and this is in Sunnyvale, everyone loves the environment. And so there are these two neighbors, true story, there are these two neighbors. Um, one of them uh, is growing redwood trees. The other puts in solar panels. And in time, the redwood trees shade the solar panels. They block, they block the sun. And the people of the solar panel, this being America, sue. They bring a lawsuit against the folks who own the trees. And they're both attachment, right? So the owner of the trees says the trees are attached to my property. I can grow them as tall as I want. The person with the solar panel says the sunlight that was going to my solar panels, that's attached to my to my house, and if you block access to the sun, you're taking something that had been attached to my house. Uh, and uh, it's not obvious who should win, right? I mean, they're both, it's good to grow trees. It's good to do solar power. There's no bad actor in this case. The court in this case basically said, it's important to the state of California that we have more renewable energy. And so they ordered the homeowners to, to lop off the top of their trees. They said, we like one attachment story better than the other because of the public policy that we care about, which is uh, encouraging renewable energy. Right. Could you explain how we might be able to use this principle to help solve climate change? Yeah. So, and it's environment more generally. So if you look at environmental problems, a lot of them arise because of poor ownership design. So in a typical situation, let's say that you're a factory owner and you produce a lot of pollution. Traditionally, once the pollution left your smokestack or left your factory, you didn't own it anymore. The public owned it. You know, thank you very much, right? It was for you, it was out of sight, out of mind. A lot of environmental law tries to reverse that, but let's take climate change in particular. So uh, one, of the, one of the major um, drivers of climate change is deforestation. Why is that? Well, trees serve a function of what's called a sink for greenhouse gases. Trees basically breathe in carbon dioxide and they exhale oxygen. And so more trees, the better. They're sucking up more CO2. 
fewer trees, the worse. Not only are there fewer trees to suck up the CO2, but when they're cut down or burned in deforestation, they actually release the carbon that they already have. So it's doubly bad. There's a problem though. If you are a landowner, you own a lot of trees, you control a lot of trees, you're providing a value uh, to the public because you're sequestering carbon, you're taking up carbon, but there's no market for that. There's no economic benefit for that. The only economic benefit you get from owning the forest is either cutting down the trees for timber or perhaps clearing them uh, for ranching or for farming. And so the economic incentives don't lead you to do something that benefits everyone. And so there's a, a certain type of ownership design that's in play right now. It's called RED, R-E-D-D, Reduced Emissions for Deforestation and Land Degradation. And basically it's a practice where the wealthy countries of the world, Norway, Germany, US to a degree, pay uh, regions of the world, number of them in Brazil, other places, to basically reduce their level of deforestation. And what they're doing, we call it as if ownership. They're saying to the landowners, we're gonna act as if you actually own the carbon that you're, that you're sequestering, that you're sucking up, even though you really don't, there's no real market for that. We're gonna create a market because we're gonna act as if you do own this. This is a strategy that watersheds are using to ensure clean water. Uh, they're basically saying to the, the, uh, the owners of land in upper watersheds, we're gonna act as if you own the clean water that you're insuring us. Um, it's similar to how fisheries, the sustainable fisheries are managed around the world. Uh, we're gonna use ownership engineering to determine uh, how many fish you're allowed, to, uh, you're allowed to catch. So it really represents a sort of new wave, a new way of thinking about environmental protection that focuses on ownership. Right, so these different kinds of rules of ownership we've been talking about, to what extent do they need to be codified in the law for them to work? Yeah, it's a good question. And the answer is, obviously, it depends. But I would say 99.9% .9 of ownership conflicts have nothing to do with the law. In the sense that, you know, we don't call in the police, we don't call in the state, we don't go to court. So, you know, think about your, your regular day, right? You go out in the morning, you close the door, it's your house. Why is it your house? You go to your car, you don't, you don't try to get into your neighbor's car. You go to your car. Why do you do that? Uh, you go into the road, um, you know, and you go, as, as we say, you know, you might go to the fast lane, might go in the slow lane. You come to a parking space, right? Why is that your space? Uh, you go, you wait in line to do something. Why is that your place in line? If someone cuts in front of you, you're not going to call the police. You're not going to bring them to court. And so there are literally hundreds of events that we have every day that turn on our understandings of ownership. And those are customs, those are norms. Now, you may be operating in what's sometimes called the shadow of the law. There may be a rule that you know about and, and you're following that. But the fact is in terms of, you know, sort of true state power, there are very, very few instances where we actually go to the state and say, enforce my ownership right, enforce my property right. Uh, it's just too expensive. You, you can't operate, can't operate that way. And so it turns out that sort of customs, politeness, courtesy, I mean, a lot of, uh, of growing up, right? A lot of, of kids sort of um, maturity involves learning ownership rules, right? There's a reason they call it the terrible twos. One of the reasons they call it the terrible twos is that kids are learning that not everything is mine, right? They realize that some things actually are not theirs. They don't own everything. Sometimes they have to share, sometimes they can't even touch. Children don't naturally take to that. They have to be acculturated. And so a lot of what it means to be a, a sort of um, uh, well-behaved, acculturated person is you understand the unspoken rules of ownership and, and you follow them. Mm -hmm. So perhaps one or two last questions because we're also reaching our time limit. Uh, would we be better off with no ownership legal protections? And so in some cases, perhaps, right? So um, Elon Musk, right? I, I guess now the wealthiest person on earth here, here Jeff Bezos, they're sort of battling, battling it out. Um, his companies uh, do not file, usually do not file patents, right? So Tesla does not file patents. SpaceX rarely files patents. 
His idea is we don't need patent protection. If we file patents, we're telling um, our competitors how we do this. And so they're going to find out anyway. Instead, he relies on secrecy uh, and on innovation, saying, you know, we are going to be innovative businesses. Uh, and so in many cases, patents actually probably are not necessary. And you look at, uh, you look at certain industries, fashion. Uh, there's no patent protection for a fashion design. And yet, fashion is an incredibly creative and productive area. So a lot of economists have written about this, this issue. It turns out there, there are certain industries, pharmaceuticals is one of those, where there's enormous capital cost in order to produce a, a single product. And so they do need some, some protection. But most industries don't need a lot of protection in order to have the incentive to be, to be creative. Uh, and so one of the arguments in our book is that in many cases we have too much ownership protection because realize as well, if you have too much ownership protection, then other people can't make use of and build on the, the inventions that are out there. Right. But I mean, if there is ownership, do you think that the kinds of ownership we have should uh, incentivize people in certain ways? Like, for example, should they incentivize innovation? That's the idea. So the traditional, the traditional story of intellectual property uh, is that if you give inventors um, ownership rights, the right to exclude, that's going to encourage them to actually be innovative and, and create these things. Um, the fashion industry suggests that's not the case. Uh, or the other question, of course, is if you're going to give ownership protection, how much and for how long? So uh, Disney uh, basically has lobbied Congress to have ownership protection of the life of the inventor, plus I think it's 72 years now. It's, some, it's an incredibly long, long period of time. You know, Walt Disney does not need protection 72 years after his death in order to create D uh, Donald Duck, right? And so the problem is that you get these, these corporations that benefit from having exclusive control over this intellectual property. And they, of course, want to extend the protections forever. Uh, and there, you know, there, there should be a pushback to say, you don't need that level of protection in order to be creative. Because at a certain point, too much protection, it's great for the people who own that property, but it, it's very difficult, it makes it very difficult for others. And so one of the big concerns that we find, um, actually we saw it with the, um, uh, with the COVID vaccine, is there are too many property rights. My co-author, Michael Heller, has written a lot about this. He calls it the tragedy of the anti-commons. And if there are too many property rights out there, it's very difficult to bring them together to actually do anything. Right. Okay, so uh, the book is again mine, How the Hidden Rules of Ownership Control Our Lives. Uh, where can people find your work on the internet, not just the book, but your work in general? Sure, so the book is sold on the internet, basically any bookseller. Um, Amazon, of course, but other, other booksellers as well. Um, we also have a website that I'd encourage your listeners to check out. It's called Mind the Book, M-I-N-E-T-H-E-B-O-O-K. Dot com. It's got 12 videos uh, that go into detail and uh, some stories I told, but a bunch of stories that I didn't tell. It's got a fun quiz to see if you're a real ownership engineer, and it's got some excerpts uh, as well. So for those of folks uh, who are interested uh, in learning more about it, I suggest go to www.mindthebook.com. Okay, very well. So, Dr. Selzman, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thanks for making mine yours. <laughs> Hi, guys. Thank you for watching the interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please consider supporting the show. It's thanks to people like you that it keeps running. I will leave links in the description box to Patreon and PayPal. Any amount, even just $1 per month, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share the interview, leave a like, and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimiro, 
Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Vissel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whitting, Bernardo Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbo, Jorge Espinha, Phil Kavanagh, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Robert, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreff, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslan Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dermiti Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roff, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, My Producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Taffini, Akion Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardes France and Thomas Trumbull, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.